Kia ora kato. Good morning and welcome everybody. The first business this morning is the submission by the Director General of Conservation. If you're able to hear me, uh, would uh, Council Mr Van Mierlo uh, like to proceed? Tēnā koutou. May it please the hearing panel. My name is Dean Van Mierlo and I am representing the Director General of Conservation at this hearing in relation to Plan Change 7 of the Canterbury Land and Water Regional Plan. Legal submissions have been filed in advance and will largely be taken as read, but I do wish to speak to and highlight some specific points or key issues arising out of the submission. Filed with legal submissions were three additional documents, a table of National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management Provisions, a spreadsheet of threatened indigenous fish habitats, otherwise known as Dataset 5, and a set of maps. I will talk to each of these documents and I also wish to signal that I will be asking the relevant witnesses involved with the preparation or familiar with those documents to speak to them uh, and introduce them as evidence when they give their evidence. In terms of a, a very broad overview, the Director General of Conservation submission supports many aspects of Plan Change 7 to the Canterbury Land and Water Regional Plan. Uh, there are, however, a number of amendments sought through the submission which aim to better promote the sustainable management purpose of the RMA, recognise and provide for Section 6 matters, have particular regard to Section 7 matters, and give effect to the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. I'm going to turn now to paragraph five and, and take the, um, the overall introduction to the submission as read, but I do wish to um, introduce the five witnesses whom you'll hear from this morning. The first witness will be Dr Tom Drinnan. Uh, Dr Drinnan's evidence focuses on lakes water quality, including Otufarikai, Ashburton Lakes and Lake Georgina and Plan Change 7 provisions concerning farm environment plans. It also covers changes to environmental flow regimes for the Temuka and Opahi FMU. The next witness you'll hear from is Ms Kate MacArthur. Ms MacArthur's evidence pertains to water quality outcomes and limits, nutrient management, stock exclusion, riparian disturbance within the region-wide OTOP and Waimakariri sub-region provisions of the Plan Change 7. You will then hear from Dr Nicholas Dunn. Dr Dunn's evidence discusses indigenous freshwater species habitat mapping uh, within, used within Plan Change 7. He will also update the hearing panel when he provides evidence on the work undertaken by himself and Dr Gray uh, with regards to reviewing mapped sites included in Plan Change 7 and updating the data underlining those maps to improve their accuracy and robustness. Um, so that's referenced there to data set five, which was included with the submissions, um, and also the maps which have been prepared by ECAN and filed with the panel. You'll next hear from Ms Anita Spencer. Ms Spencer is a senior ager with the Department of Conservation. Now, her evidence specifically re relates to the Isaac Wildlife and Conservation Trust site at Peacock Springs. And finally, you'll hear from Mr Murray Brass. Mr Brass is a senior RMA planner, and he provides a planning analysis of Plan Change 7 and the Director General's submission and relief sought. Turning now to some of the key issues raised in the Director General's submission, and the first point I wish to discuss is the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management 2020. Uh, now, as the panel, of course, is very well aware, this NPS came into effect on the 3rd of September, uh, and the Regional Council is required to give effect to the NPS FM 2020 as soon as reasonably practicable. Uh, I concur with the statement from my learned friend, Mr Moore, when opening for the Regional Council that to the extent that there is scope to do so, this panel should strive to give effect to the NPSFM 2020. Now, in my submission, the NPSFM supports much of the relief sought in the Director General of Conservation submission, 
and that providing for that relief will assist in giving effect to the provisions of the NPS as soon as reasonably practicable. That said, however, there are some aspects of um, the NPS which will be outside the scope of Plan Change 7, uh, and that is likely to require uh, further work in future, and I submit likely to mean further plan changes to fully give effect to the NPS 2020. Tamana Otawai is given heightened prominence in the NPS FM 2020. There is now an explicit hierarchy of obligations in Tamana Otawai that prioritises first the health and well-being of water bodies and freshwater ecosystems, second the health needs of people such as drinking water, and third the ability of people and communities to provide for their social, economic and cultural well-being now and in the future. Tamana Otawai is a fundamental concept relevant to all freshwater management. And in my submission, this really is something of a compass point within the new NPS. This gives direction to all decisions that will need to be made under it. How are these priorities being applied? Is the health and well-being of water bodies and freshwater ecosystems being prioritised first? As this is what Tamana Otawai requires. Now, like other submitters, the Director-General's Evidence-in-Chief was prepared and filed prior to the NPSFM being gazetted, and notwithstanding references in that evidence to the NPSFM 2017, it's submitted that the evidence remains relevant and directly applicable. Indeed, overall, the NPSFM 2020 has strengthened the planning and legal rationale for the relief sought in the DGC's submission. Now, for the assistance of the hearing panel, a comparative table of provisions of the previous NPS uh, referred to in the evidence in chief of the Director General and the updated comparable provision in the NPS FM 2020 has been prepared and filed with these legal submissions. And as I've indicated earlier, Mr Brass will uh, speak to this when he presents his evidence. I turn briefly now to nutrient management. Um, I don't wish to comment in detail on this. Um, in terms of the NPS FM 2020, I note that every regional council must, at a minimum, set appropriate in-stream concentrations and exceedance criteria for dissolved inorganic nitrogen and dissolved reactive phosphorus and that where a regional council detects that an FMU or part of an FMU is degraded or degrading, it must, as soon as practicable, take proportionate action to halt or reverse that degradation. Now, in my submission, these are directive policies, and so the direction of travel in the new NPS is quite explicit. In terms of water quality in rivers, um, I comment in relation to the Orari, Temuka, Opehi and Pariora rivers. Um, the Director General's submission supports the approach of applying zone-specific water quality outcomes and limits. Where changes are sought, it is to ensure that water quality limits give effect to the outcomes described and sought in the plan change to safeguard the life supporting, supporting capacity of fresh water in the region and provide for the compulsory values of ecosystem health and human contact. In relation to lakes, the evidence of the DGC presented by Dr Drennan notes the high cultural and conservation value of small to medium sized Canterbury high country lakes, including Māori lakes, lakes Emily and Georgina. These provide habitat for a range of threatened and at-risk indigenous birds, fish, invertebrates and plants. I don't propose to reiterate the technical detail uh, in relation to water quality and water quantity topics. Uh, I have summarised that in the written legal submissions and of course you have the, the evidence before you and you'll be hearing from the witnesses shortly. In terms of river flows in relation to the Tamuka catchment, the Director General supports the phasing out of over allocation through a staged process of increased minimum flows, reduced allocation limits. 
Again, I note the relevance of the NPSFM 2020, which requires that all existing over allocation be phased out. Clearly that's carried through from the, um, the earlier NPS. I do note Dr Drennan participated in the online expert conferencing on freshwater quality and ecology in the OTOP subregion that resulted in a joint witness statement which will be before the panel. Dr Drennan supports the higher minimum flows for January and February proposed by the Adaptive Management Working Group. I turn next to a new topic, fish passage and fish barriers. Um, I note in the legal submissions the NPS 2020 has required an objective regarding fish passage to be inserted into the plan without recourse to the RMA Schedule 1 process. Uh, I, I'm aware that that process has been completed now. It was, um, I believe, notified the day the legal submissions were filed earlier this week. Um, the NPS then goes on to describe further requirements in relation to fish passage in relation to the development of policies. Um, there is um, implementation steps that are required to be undertaken, including consultation or seeking advice from the Department of Conservation and also from other statutory fisheries agencies, such as Fish and Game. Uh, now, in my submission, those steps will require further process to be undertaken. Um, and they are detailed policies which are required to be implemented through or as a consequence of the new provisions in the NPS. Mm -hmm. Now those detailed policies are in my submission outside the scope of Plan Change 7, uh, quite simply because of the, the process steps which are required to be undertaken and the detailed consultation uh, and information gathering that's required. That said, however, we do have a new objective um, inserted into the plan, and in my submission it's appropriate that there's a policy in place to um, provide for the implementation of that objective. And there is scope within Plan Change 7 to look at policies regarding fish passage. Uh, Mr Brass discover, discusses this uh, in his rebuttal evidence uh, and his evidence in chief, um, and he's considered the evidence also of Ms White for Meridian, in this context and, and proposed uh, some policy wording which um, it is submitted would assist in giving effect to the new NPS objective. Um, also note for completeness that there is a rule regime which has been inserted through the National Environmental Standard for Freshwater Management uh, 2020. Um, relating both to in-stream structures and provision of fish passage. I turn now to the topic of indigenous freshwater species habitat. Um, and for this, this section, there is a bit of detail here and I will, will be following the written submissions to some extent. Um, so we're starting at your paragraph 62. Is that yes, it? that's that's correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. At paragraph 62. So the Director General's submission supported in part the notified maps. However, it also noted some concern around discrepancies between the underlying data regarding fish distributions in Canterbury, as provided by DOC to ECAN, and the distributions presented in the notified maps. Now, a particular concern expressed related to how habitats within artificial water bodies were mapped, and the submission expressly noted a desire by the Department of Conservation to work with ECAN to refine the mapping data set. Submission also identified the need to ensure the mapping data set will be updated in future. Now, my submission, the overall theme of the submission on this point is the Director General of Conservation's desire to ensure the maps accurately reflect the known location of relevant species habitat. Uh, through the Section 42A process, there were a number of changes to the notified maps, um, and that included removal of a number of mapped habitat sites, and also changes from polygons to polylines, um, and you'll hear further about those, uh, I think, from the witnesses. Now, in my submission, the issues regarding the accurate mapping are important. Um, it's important that the maps reflect the most up-to-date knowledge of the species that are being mapped. 
some of these species are rather cryptic <coughs> and some of these species are very threatened. And so it goes without saying that the best information that's available needs to be reflected in the maps. I'm moving on to paragraph 69 now. In order to clarify and resolve these issues, uh, DOC staff have spent a substantial amount of time working with ECAN over the last two months to review the mapping data set <coughs> and verify the mapping of habitat of threatened indigenous freshwater fish species in Canterbury proposed for inclusion of Plan Change 7. And this has been a constructive process in my submission. And it, it's really been a case of we've had, you know, in my submission, quite an unusually long uh, lead-in time to the, the current hearing. Uh, and that, that time's been put to good advantage in my submission by experts coming together, uh, Dr Dunn and his counterpart, Dr Gray at ECAN, and working constructively together to try and understand <coughs> the respective concerns and see if some resolutions couldn't be reached. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to report that some resolutions have been reached between the experts. Um, you'll hear further about that. Um, but in summary, some agreement was reached regarding removing some sites where threatened fish species are, are no longer present and removing some sites where threatened species habitat, uh, the aquatic habitat, is no longer present because obviously if the aquatic habitat's not there, then the species aren't going to be there. Uh, reinserting some sites which were originally included within the publicly notified habitat maps but then proposed to be removed through the Section 42A process and then better spatially defining a number of sites to more accurately reflect the known habitat extent. Now, as I've indicated, Dr Dunn has undertaken this work for the Department of Conservation and he will speak to the process um, and the agreed changes with Dr Gray, who was the lead for ECAN. Um, as I've mentioned, attached to the legal submissions was data set five, which contains the outcome of the work undertaken by Dr Dunn and Dr Gray. And I note specifically that Dr Dunn's review was limited to threatened non-migratory freshwater fish species. It did not include the habitat distributions of freshwater crayfish, freshwater mussels, or giant cockapoo. Now, very recently, ECAN has helpfully prepared a set of maps to reflect the revised data set as agreed by Dr. Dunn and Dr. Gray, and provided those maps to the Department of Conservation. And a copy of those maps was also attached to the legal submissions, and we'll have a look at some of those maps through the course of the morning. Um, now, it's understood that these maps, which were prepared by ECAN staff, have combined the outcome of the work undertaken by Dr Dunn and Dr Gray in relation to threatened non-migratory fish species, that's i.e. data set five, with the habitat layers for the other three map species, i.e. freshwater crayfish, freshwater mussels and giant cockapoo, uh, which resulted in the production of data set six, and then this has been mapped against the habitat distributions previously recommended in the Section 42A report. And it is important to note that they are mapped against the 42A report recommendations and not against the notified habitat. The, the, so they're not mapped against the full extent of the maps as notified initially in Plan Change 7. And the significance of this is that an area that may appear to be a new piece of habitat in the maps that you will look at this morning, uh, if it is different to the previous section 42A recommendation, it, it may appear as new habitat, but in fact it may simply be, and generally is, simply a reinstatement of what was previously notified rather than a new piece of habitat. Um, I'm moving on to paragraph 72. It's anticipated that the panel will be interested in questions of scope in relation to any potential changes in habitat mapping. In my submission, issues of scope would not arise where habitat sites which were originally notified as part of Plan Change 7 but were then proposed for deletion through the Section 42A report are now recommended to be retained. And similarly, removal of a site or part of a site from the habitat mapping layers where the experts 
agree that it do does not contain a species habitat and also in my submission does not give rise to a scope issue. That's just simply reflecting the, the facts on the ground or in the water as the experts uh, see it. Now, refine. Okay. Yeah, I'm thanking you for addressing that. Yes. Now, refinement of a site to more accurately reflect the spatial location on the ground or in the water, likewise in my submission, does not give rise to a scope issue. Such a refinement of a notified habitat site is on the proposed plan, and it is not proposing something completely novel, and nor is it out of left field. Now, and just to give some context here, in some cases these, these refinements um, are, are changes to better, better reflect things like satellite imagery um, and arise out of the use of polylines rather than polygons, so polylines mapping the, the upstream and downstream extent of the known habitat. And again, as I said before, we'll, we'll look at some illustrations of that and, and hopefully that will become fairly clear. Um, however, it's accepted that inclusion of a new habitat site which was not previously notified could give rise to concerns regarding scope. And for this reason, the Director General of Conservation is not seeking the inclusion of any such new site through Plan Change 7. And just for completeness, I note that there was one such new site that arose through the work of Dr Dunn, Dr Gray. Uh, that has been excluded from data set five and I understand is excluded from the maps which are before you. I turn then to the NPSFM 2020, again because uh, this is um, relevant to all this work in my submission. And this, the NPS does require regional councils to identify the location of habitats of threatened species. and directs that this is to occur as soon as reasonably practical. Um, and in my submission, the work undertaken by Dr Dunn and Dr Gray is directed in ensuring that the hearing panel has before it the most up-to-date information regarding known habitats of threatened fish species in Canterbury. And in my submission, will assist you in um, giving effect to the NPSFM in, in this respect. Moving on, um, I do note an issue regarding the, um, the title threatened, uh, threatened Indigenous Freshwater Species. Um, the reality is that the, the map species includes habitat for all threatened freshwater fish species in Canterbury. It includes habitat for freshwater mussels, freshwater crayfish, uh, neither of which are classified as threatened species under the New Zealand conservation status system. It does not include habitat for other threatened freshwater invertebrates, uh, unless coincidentally uh, within the mapped areas, and nor does it include habitat for other threatened species such as birds which rely on fresh water. Now in the Director General's submission, the highest priority for habitat mapping in Plan Change 7 is that of threatened fish species. The Director General would also support over time the inclusion of thre threatened freshwater invertebrate plant and bird species habitat, but accepts that um, some of that may be out of scope, Plan Change 7. Um, and the Director General also supports the inclusion of known kakahi, kekawai and habitat within the mapping layers, understanding that these species are not classified as threatened. I propose to take the balance of the legal submissions as read. I just wish to briefly touch on one, one last point, and that is the uh, Peacock Springs site owned by the Isaac Wildlife and Conservation Trust, uh, and the Director General of Conservation supports the removal of that site from the mapping layers for the reasons that have been outlined in the submissions and discussed in the evidence. Now, of course, um, that concludes the legal submissions, but I'm happy to endeavour to answer any questions for the panel. Commissioner Van Velt, is there any questions of Council? Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning. Just a couple of matters. Uh, the first one is that your pair is 33 and 34. Yes. 
and it's this issue of the interplay between Schedule 8 and then um, water quality tables in the zone specific sections. Yes. And it seems to be a nonsensical situation that if in a zone specific table there are some attributes listed but some are not listed that are covered in Schedule 8, that Schedule 8 is somehow then deemed not to apply within that sub-region. I just don't understand that approach and I don't understand that's consistent with Policy 4.7 of the Regional Plan. Are you able to comment further on that, both in terms of what the plan actually says and the, and the actual sensibility of the approach? Uh, I, I agree. In terms of sensibility first, I agree it, it is a nonsensical approach um, because it, it essentially creates a policy gap, in my view, unless we're absolutely confident that all the relevant attributes are listed in those sub-regional tables. Um, in terms of the policy wording, I mean, without sort of bur burrowing into, into the document, um, I do recall looking at it some, some time ago. It appeared ambiguous at best and it was mm. arguable um, yeah. alternatively. Um, nonetheless, that was the interpretation that ECAN provided us, so mm. we've highlighted that mm. uh, for your attention. And if that is the, if that is the approach that is to be applied, mm then in my submission it does create a gap which needs to be filled. Um, alternatively, maybe some wording can be amended to ensure that that's not the interpretation that's applied. Yep, no, thank you for that, and I certainly think um, the latter suggestion would be a sensible one for us to pursue. It just doesn't make sense to me otherwise. Yes. The correspondence received from ECAN, I, I think, is um, annexed to um, yep. Mr Brass's evidence. Yep. No, thank you. And just one other uh, question at paragraph 80. 80? Yeah, it's on the top of page 23, so Thank that's you. the tail end of paragraph 80. Yes. And you say, accordingly, amendment may be appropriate to the name of the threatened species maps, but you don't tell us what it should be. <laughs> Maybe one of the witnesses can help us out with some, some wording that they think is appropriate. Yes, I mean, clearly sim simply referring to threatened species is... Um, it's ambiguous in, in my submission, Unint probably unintentionally misleading. Um, equally, it's, they're not all freshwater species clearly that are there. Um, there are threatened species, but there are also other highly valued species that are there. So uh, something that fairly recognises that. And I'm, you're entirely correct and fair comment. I haven't yeah. provided a, a wording, but it's something that I think needs to be reflected on. Maybe um, is it Mr Dunn or Dr Dunn, sorry, I can't remember which, can help us when we come to him. He's may have discussed this at length with Dr Gray over cups of coffee, perhaps, while they were amending all the maps. But, I mean, it is important to get the name correct, and, yes. a, and a short name's better than a long name yes. in terms of the ac acronym that will result. So. Yes. OK, thank you. But other than that, no further questions found. The legal submissions very clearly set out, so thank you. Commissioner Solomon, anything you'd like to ask of Council? No, no questions from me. Mr Van Mielo, thank you for your full and, and clear submissions. We're grateful to you for that. Um, should we now proceed to uh, Dr Drennan's yes. evidence? Very well. Sir, if it pleases you, I'll just introduce the witness and then hand him over for questioning. Your full name is Joseph John Thomas Joseph Drennan? Correct. Loudly, please. Oh, correct. And you've prepared a statement of evidence in this matter dated 17 July 2020? Correct. You've also participated in expert conferencing on the 18th of August 2020? Yes. Do you have any changes you wish to make to your evidence? Uh, no, just to reiterate that I was involved at the expert conferencing for the uh, freshwater quality, the OTOP subregion, um, and as stated in the joint witness statement, I agree with the proposed changes um, regarding the artificial freshes uh, for policy uh, for 14.4.35, um, and also agree with the the adaptive management working groups recommended minimum flow uh, changes for the Opahee main stem. 
Thank you. And please answer any further questions from the panel. <clears throat> Commissioner Solomon, do you have any questions to ask of Dr Drinan? Yes, I do. I just have a couple. Um, good morning, Mr Drinan. Um, with regard to water quality of Māori Lake, Māori Lakes, Emily and Lakes Georgina, these culturally significant lakes are not in a healthy state. I refer to the office re officer's report at page 42, paragraph 519, where it was re recommended to reject the submission of DOC that requested a review of existing e FEPs and impose further reductions of nitrates due to the significant lag time for on-farm on improvements to show in the system. My question is, has DOC undertaken any modelling that shows what the state of the lake's ecosystems will be like in 2030 if the status quo prevails? We have um, undertaken a, quite a bit of monitoring of water quality in the streams in the Maori Lakes catchments at a number of points, and that is displaying um, obviously the uh, current water quality state which is degraded and also showing degrading trends particularly with regards to nitrogen and um, especially nitrate for some of the receiving tributaries for Maori Lakes. As for modelling there was some additional modelling uh, commissioned by the department which looked at catchment land use and loads to the lake but as for a particular modelling and looking at the outcomes uh, in, in, in time in 2030, no, we, we haven't undertaken any of those assessments. We just we feel that the current trends um, obviously risk, and it's also quite difficult to actually predict when a change may occur in some of these lakes, so that modelling would have a, a degree of uncertainty about it. So I'm sorry, I don't think I've explained myself correctly. I wanted to know if any modelling has been undertaken on ecosystems as a result of degraded water quality. Uh, if, if I understand you correctly, uh, the Gawthron modelling has linked um, the water quality within the lakes with measures of ecosystem health, and they have found that water quality monitoring of the water quality state is associated with uh, measures of ecological health or ecological integrity and that the catchment land use um, which appears to be driving um, the nutrient runoff load to these lakes um, has a, um, an impairment or has an adverse effect on the these attributes of ecological health that were modelled. So does it does, it, does the modelling give the extent of, the, of the, how it affects the ecosystems? Does it give an extent or a measurement? Or? It, only in so far as that there is a relationship between the catchment land use in terms of nutrient losses and the ecological state okay. for particular attributes of the ecosystem. Um, and just one more at page 55, paragraph 7. Point two seven, when you recommended what the summertime minimum flow should be uh, to provide for native fish of the Tamuka River, why did you not recommend 1.6 or 1.7 to provide for the 22 species of the Tamuka River rather than the 1.4 which you recommended? Uh, the, I could have recommended a, a higher minimum flow. It was based on a, you know, there's a gradient uh, within these uh, percentage of habitat retained tables. Uh, I felt that retained uh, an adequate degree of uh, habitat for a wide range of species. Obviously, higher minimum flows would be would be better, but that was a, a reasonable a reasonable degree of protection. I felt. Thank you. That's all. Commissioner Van Dorthelsen. Thank you, Dr. Drinney. And first of all, just uh, an observation. It's refreshing for me as a commissioner to see a situation where Department of Conservation, Fish and Game, 
and the adaptive management working group in terms of the minimum flow at sales yard, sale yards bridge all agree on what the full allocation flow should be. That certainly makes our consideration of that earlier uh, easier. So thank you for the work that's gone into obviously discussing that with all the agencies and the caucusing, etc. Um, just one question in terms of where you uh, recommend uh, water quality limits or changes to the notified provisions, are your recommendations consistent with those of Ms MacArthur? Like, uh, are you aligned on that? Yes, yes, I'm aligned. But I go one step further in recommending that the outcomes for the outcomes and the associated water quality limits for all small to medium sized high country lakes, which includes Maori Lakes, Lakes Emily and Georgina, be set to a TLI target of three or less. And that's at your power of 543, is it? I, th I think where you make that, and it's one of your first conclusions and that part of your evidence. But apart from that, you're consistent in your, in your recommendations to us. I just also have a question on power um, 7.27. The current minimum flow in the Tamuka, as I understand it, is 700 litres per second. You're recommending it be doubled to 1,400 litres per second. Have you considered or have you um, modelled what impact that would have on the reliability of supply for current abstractors? No, I have not. All right, that's all. Other than that, thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Drinan. Uh, may we go to your 545 on page, I think, 35, is it? You may have different pagination. Here you're making reference to ensuring greater parity uh, between landowners and adjoining catchments. Is that a factor? that's mandated by the legislation or the uh, NPS or other instruments? Not that I'm aware of. No, it was uh, uh, my opinion. So is it an environmental issue? This question of parity between landowners? No, no, it's not. Dr. Drinan, thank you so much for all the trouble you've taken in uh, your work and in presenting it a clear statement of evidence for us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <clears throat> Next witness is Ms Kate MacArthur. Thank you. Now your full name is Catherine Jane MacArthur? It is. And you've prepared a statement of evidence in this matter dated 17 July 2020? I have. Do you have any changes or revisions you wish to make to your evidence? Uh, I, I just wanted to identify uh, a few points that have changed in terms of the MPSFM 2020 amendments. Uh, good morning. Uh, I think probably the most expedient way to do that might be just to work through them in the executive summary noting that they do cascade through each of the zones on the same points in terms of the same attributes. Thank you. So we're starting at paragraph 18, is it? Yes, I, I'm the, the first point to make is probably at paragraph 19, and it's just a brief note 
that the improvement in QMCI from 3.5 to 4.5, just to note that that uh, is now the national bottom line for QMCI that's included in Appendix 2B of the MPSFM 2020, so it's consistent with getting to that national bottom line threshold. Just, just pause for a moment, let me, let me just follow that. So if it helps, that's table 14 on page 53 of the MPSFM. Yes, yes, I've got to it now. Thank you very much. Yes, I can see that. <clears throat> Too many pieces of paper, excuse me. Um, I think that the next point is probably if we uh, skip to paragraph 22, uh, where I'm talking there about the change in perifitin attribute from an absolute maximum to the 8 and 17 percent exceedance uh, approach that's in the MPSFM. Uh, I, I note in the evidence that, uh, in my view, that is, that is a change ecologically, and therefore, if the exceedance criteria are to be applied as is consistent with the NPSFM, in my view, the attribute state should be at 120 milligrams per metre squared rather than the national bottom line of 200. Now, I, I make the point that that's in order to meet the QMCI outcomes of six in the hillfed lower and lakefed rivers that I've identified in the evidence. And I guess the note there to make with respect to the 2020 MPS is that uh, that QMCI of six sits within the B-band state of the same table we were referring to, table 14, and that that, that is consistent with the B-band for perifitin of 120 if the exceedance percentiles are included as I've recommended. So those two outcomes then sit at the same uh, level of attribute state as far as the MPS is concerned. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a correction to paragraph 23, uh, third line down, and that I have misspelt Waitarakau. Uh, somehow an extra K has snuck into that one. Thank you. Now, over the page, uh, this is with respect to paragraphs 24, 25 and 28 at the bottom, um, talking about Tiakaka, Estuary, Waitarakau, and uh, the relationship between TLI outcomes and uh, total nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations. And I think the point I'd like to make there with reference to the new framework of the NOF under the MPS is that um, these lakes and lagoons and estuaries are, are in a degraded state. So section 320 of the MPS FM in terms of responding to de degradation is in my view quite relevant. And also section 313, which is the special provisions for DIN and DRP, or for nutrients, as these are sensitive, nutrient sensitive downstream receiving environments. So those provisions, I think, are an important consideration in looking at the DIN and DRP concentrations for contributing water bodies that are flowing into those receiving environments but also the nature of the receiving environments themselves in that they are degraded below national bottom lines and under the MPS require some response from the council. If I take you now to paragraph 26, um, I guess the key point is that nitrate toxicity national bottom lines have moved in the 2020 MPS. So they are now set at what was formerly the B-band state, or it may even still be called the B-band, I can't recollect. 
and that's table six on page 45 of the NPS. Yes, it is still the B band. Uh, and these were the levels that I have recommended um, essentially should be bottom lines for nitrate toxicity to avoid the risks of growth effects on sensitive freshwater species, particularly fish. So just to um, confirm that the MPSFM approach now to nitrate toxicity and ammonia toxicity bottom lines uh, is consistent with what I've recommended in evidence that those uh, attribute states should be. I guess the only comment I would make outside of my executive summary, um, and it's a general one, which I probably don't have a direct answer to, but it's an issue that's arisen, is uh, if I can take you to paragraph 59 on page 15 of my evidence. There's some discussion at the bottom of that. Oh, sorry. It just takes a moment sometimes sure. to, to bring these up. Paragraph 59. Yes, so near the bottom of that, I'm talking about the footnotes to Schedule 8. Yes. And uh, it talks there in the footnotes about um, maintenance of water quality and it has a shall not deteriorate below 2018 levels. Now we now have uh, provisions and a definition in the MPSFM about what the baseline state is and there are three options there for selecting the most stringent baseline state within the definition. And then within the National Objectives Framework, sections 310 and 311 flow through from uh, determining the baseline state and then setting target attribute states relevant to that baseline state. So I'm just highlighting that that's quite possibly an issue that may need to be looked at. Um, I don't have an immediate answer for you on what that should look like. And I think those are the general changes. They do, of course, flow through into the recommendations for both of the sub-regions as well as at the regional scale in terms of the evidence I've provided on the water quality attributes. Well, thank you. <coughs> and uh, we, of course, had the opportunity to read your full uh, evidence statement. Thank you for that. Is it uh, appropriate now if we go to any questions that we have for you on that? Yes, please do. Yes. Commissioner Van Vortusen. Yeah, thank you, Ms MacArthur. As usual, your evidence is very comprehensive and detailed, so I don't have any questions of you because what you're recommending to us, you've clearly outlined the reasons for that, so I don't need to clarify your thinking. It's clearly laid out. But to the reporting officers, I'd like to make a request of you that in reply, what I would appreciate seeing is a, a table, and you're probably going to have to use an A3 landscape format for this table, but what I'd like you to do for all of the water quality uh, tables for rivers and lakes that Change 7 refers to, if you could set out a table for each parameter and state what the notified parameter was, if you can, then state in the next column what the current environmental monitoring that the council undertakes indicates that the current actual state of that water body is, so the notified parameter, what it actually is based on monitoring, where that sits in the new MPSFM 2020 NOF attribute bands. And then, this is where you might need quite a wide table, DOC and other submitters have sought changes to these tables, so if you could just note in the table a column for each change sought by a, a submitter, and then have for us at the very end of that table, in the final column, your recommendation on what the number should be with reasons. And if you could do that, I would find that extremely helpful. 
any crystal clear what I'm asking for? Okay. Yes, I've got that, and I've noted the time. Um, All right, yeah, from the yes. transcript. Yeah. Yes. Yep, good Thank point. You. If there's any clarity we need, we'll come back to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, uh, but Ms McCarthy, as I said, no questions for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Solomon. Uh, actually, what um, Rob's asked for is answered, will answer my question. Mm -hmm. So that's helpful. Thank you. Now, coming back to Ms McArthur, um, I'm, I'm looking at your <clears throat> page 25, paragraph 99. Yes. And uh, I understand what you've said there, but I'm wondering whether you're also considering or whether you, you don't think it's appropriate to consider the ecological health of groundwater in aquifers, a matter that's been raised in evidence before us. I definitely think that that's important and one of the issues of course is that springs are upwelling of groundwater so for one to be healthy the other has to be healthy as well and then surface waters obviously drain into groundwater in other places so I think there does need to be some express provision for ecosystem health and groundwater. I haven't specifically commented on that but I do believe that it is, um, it is a need and that uh, it is within the, within the realm of the NPS 2020 to provide for ecosystem health across all freshwater bodies. So would you regard that groundwater in aquifers as distinct from where it expresses on the surface through springs uh, is part of the why in the Timana or to why the subject of the NPS? Yes, I do think it is. Well, Ms MacArthur, thank you. you uh, as uh, my colleague has said, you've given us a, a full and clearly explained uh, statement of evidence and we're grateful to you for it. Thank you, Mr Chair. The next witness is Dr Nicholas Dunn. Thank you. Now your full name is Nicholas Rex Dunn. It is. And you've prepared a statement of evidence in this matter dated 17 July 2020. I have. Do you have any changes or revisions that you wish to make to your evidence? I do note uh, one um, change that I'd like to bring to the attention of the uh, panel, and that is yes. <coughs> um, point 31K, which is on page 10 of my evidence in chief. And then in relation to... Just pause a moment while it comes up. Yes, at the top of the page. Yes, um, point K is um, discussing the notified um, maps, but point three um, needs to be amended. And my colleague, Dr Gray, has um, pointed out to me uh, subsequent to my evidence that um, the notified maps were actually polygons, not polylines. So there's a slight uh, change in timing. But this, this point can be discussed and has been discussed by Mr Van Merler uh, 
Uh, yes. But just, just let me be sure that I've got the, the, correct, the correct amendment to, to the script of your evidence. It says data was supplied as polygons, but CRC had converted those to polylines. Which of those words do you wish to alter? It's not so much altering the words, it's just clarifying that point three relates to the section 42A maps, not the notified maps. Well, thank you for that. Now, that paragraph 31 of your evidence in chief, on page 7, you referred to the desirability of peer review or further caucusing in relation to the mapping of indigenous freshwater species. Yes. Now, as I've referred to, you've undertaken some further work with Dr. Gray. Could you speak to that further work um, and clarify for the panel what that involved um, and how that relates back to those comments about peer review and um, caucusing? Uh, yes. Um, so in my evidence in chief, I made a assessment of the Section 42A maps and I raised a number of points uh, about the mapping exercise. And subsequent um, to filing the, my evidence, Dr Gray and I have uh, spent considerable time to refine those maps um, and those are the maps uh, which are presented here. Um, uh, could we use it? Uh, just, just bring it up on screen. To the, to the so, to assist the panel, we'd like to bring up. Um, the set of maps which were attached to the um, legal submissions, which are the ones that um, Dr. Dunn is referring to. Um, Thank you. And I'd really like just to, like to invite uh, Dr. Dunn to talk to those and, and explain the process by which um, the work was undertaken to develop those and uh, talk through what they illustrate for the assistance of the panel. Thank you. Uh, I think to help the panel, I'll just run through. We talk about a data, data set five and a data set six. So the data sets which precede those, I'll just run you through what those are, just for clarification. So data set one is what I refer to as the uh, the map work which I supplied to Canary Regional Council um, during the development of the provisions for the Indigenous Species Habitat Mapping. Data set two is the notified uh, maps. Data set three is a section 42A officers uh, modifications. And data set four is my change or recommended changes to the section 42A maps. And data set five is an agreed uh, with Dr. Gray, an agreed uh, uh, data set of my changes uh, to the non migratory uh, freshwater fish habitats. And so data set six then is the combination of data set five plus the 
uh, additional species which Dr. Gray uh, undertook the mapping for, being uh, freshwater crayfish, freshwater mussels, um, giant kokapu, and short jaw kokapu. So in the work that was undertaken, and this was um, done in agreement with Dr. Gray, um, it really sought to just make sure that the correct habitats were included and of those habitats that were included, the uh, spatial extents were as up to date as possible. And at times that required refinement and I can go into uh, some examples of what that entailed. So I'll just ask the panel to uh, bring up the uh, maps that Canterbury Regional Council um, have provided and was filed with the uh, DOC submission, uh, legal submission. And I'll just refer to the map sheet numbers to, um, in my examples. Um, that was a ginormous file, so I didn't download that to my little laptop. Do you have it on your... Can you put the map up on the screen that you wish to talk to without us, us having to have it on our laptops? Uh, we'll have it on the big screen yeah, great. just behind okay. you. So. Mm, thanks. Can, can I just confirm, Mr Chairman, do you have, have the maps um, visually available to you? No, no I do not. I see. OK, we've got them on I the... Can see, I can see what you've, you've shared on the... Yeah on the team's uh, screen. Okay. I can see that clearly. Great. But that's all I wanted to confirm. So we'll, we'll run through some, some maps and we'll, we'll just refer to them by sheet number and they'll be on the screen. And if anyone can't see them, please let us know. Right. Um, we'll go through it. So if we turn to uh, match sheet five, and we also filed was the table which sits behind the geospatial uh, information, um, and these explanations are included in that. Um, on sheet five, we have in red, oh, do we have a laser pointer? Mm -hmm. oh. That's <laughs> the red stands out clearly. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll use the um, hand here to mm. indicate what I'm discussing. Um, yes, is clear. so as we can see, the section 42A, um, Holly line uh, is in red. Data set six is in blue, which sits behind it. And unfortunately, the cartography is not the best, but um, the lake habitats are also in blue. And I won't refer so much to the lake habitats because they are still poly lines and the non-migratory freshwater fish um, aren't um, occurring in lake habitats. They're only occurring in the um, habitats which are mapped as lines. So this is an example uh, from North Canterbury where there's no change to the data set um, because it 
we we consider it, it, it adequately maps the known habitat. So that's an example of a no change. Blue lines data set six, or are they rivers or both? So the, the background map is a um, topographical map. And the blue line, you can just see, these are not my maps, sorry. Um, I would have used different colours. Yes. Um, oh, yes. This is a reflection on Dr Gray, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> the, the blue line out, outlining the red line is data set six. I think it'll become clearer as we work through some other examples. And these are just examples. Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll turn to um, map sheet 13. So th this is an example from the Clarence River catchment, and I'll just draw your t attention to this uh, water body here called the Ribble, and this indicates um, both the red line and the blue line for section 42A in red and data set 6 in blue, but you can see that there's a difference in the extents of those two lines. And the difference there is the blue line is based on the um, polygon which I originally supplied during the development period. And that polygon was based on expert opinion um, gathered during the development of that underlying data set. <coughs> Dr Gray was of the opinion um, and he represented it here in the red. Um, but I, I prefer the longer held view that the habitat extends further upstream. And so I've uh, changed the mapping extent back to what was reflected in the notified plan. So we've worked within the constraints of the upstream and downstream extent of a notified plans. Well, thank you. Yep. Uh, I think we've reached a, a time in the morning when it's convenient for us to take a short break. And uh, we'll do that now. And um, you can consider what you'd like to show to us next by way of explaining what's recorded on the maps. Yes. But yes. we'll take a break for a quarter of an hour now. Yes. And just to for, foreshadow, sir, um, we were proposing to go through, I think there was about eight or nine maps in total that we we're going to look at. We're certainly not going through them all, um, just some examples, which I think will illustrate the various um, images. And, yeah. Yes, well, I'm not wanting to cut you short of your presentation, no. Mr Van Bielo, yes. but I think it's a good time for the, at the moment for us to take a break. Certainly. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Dunn. If you'd like to continue, please. Mm. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, so map sheet 21. This is an example of a habitat which is considered to be extinct. It's in the um, Lake Sumner catchment in the, the upper Hiranui River. And it's been excluded from um, data set five and data set six based on that information. What do you mean by extinct? The species, um, the upland longjaw galaxis, this one relates to, 
uh, hasn't been re-recorded in that habitat since in the uh, late 1970s. And that's likely due to salmonid predation. So the habitat still exists, but the species doesn't exist in that habitat. If we go to uh, map sheet 40, And I'll draw your attention to this habitat in the Wilberforce in the Rakaia River catchment. Uh, that's an example of um, differences in how um, the, my underlying data set were created using the river environment classification uh, version 2 model and how um, Dr. Gray has um, represented the habitat using a more freeform polyline. And the, we've reshaped the, what we consider the, um, the habitat, but within the upstream downstream extents as in the notified plan. So we better reflect the um, position of the channels as such. Um, if we go through to 59, uh, map sheet 59 please. And I again apologise for the cartographic representation here. Many of these sites that you can make out um, within the Avon and Heathcote catchments um, relate to freshwater mussels or freshwater crayfish and are produced by Dr Gray. But over here you might just be able to make it out uh, is Travis Wetland and this is a example of a translocated Canterbury mudfish um, population which is since considered to have, uh, that translocation is considered to have failed um, largely due to the habitat drying up as the land um, shifted during the earthquakes. Um, 66. 66. If we turn to page 66, or map sheet 66, sorry. So this is in the um, Selwyn River catchment, and this uh, lake body here is uh, Lake Ellesmere, and uh, State Highway 1 is here for your orientation. These lines here uh, represent both or either the uh, Selwyn District Council Stockwater Race Network or in this vicinity the um, Canterbury Regional Council Managed Drainage Network. And this area is the Kalinchney Swamp, a former wetland um, and what happened is there, there were often a lack of surface channels, um, but there was standing water. And they were, the, the channels were undefined often, but you can see in the, in the upper reaches here, there are more natural channels. And so the, the freshwater fish and freshwater mussels are now occurring in what are considered to be modified or artificial uh, water races. The, there was some discussion around this habitat between Dr Gray and myself, but it's of my opinion that the notified 
uh, version be retained because it in includes uh, spring habitats which feed into the tops of those uh, drains. And a lot of that habitat needs to be retained because it is because of um, it, the movement of a fish within those small areas. It is a small amount of habitat on the ground. Uh, if we go to map sheet 84. Uh, this is another example of a former wetland area. This is um, just south of Ashburton in the Long Beach area. And this is uh, Eiffelton, Hines, just for your orientation, Lake Hood. Again, um, this area had uh, channels through it, but they've since been uh, modified into stockwater races or drains, and these are often the, uh, this drainage network is managed by Environment Canterbury as well. A lot of the um, habitats are now um, no longer there, such as here. Um, they were stockwater races, um, and they've since been filled in. So both the habitat and the species are not present. This is an example of a natural um, channel which then feeds into a more artificial or modified uh, watercourse. And here's an example in the Hines River of freshwater uh, mussels or freshwater crayfish habitat. And one last map sheet, 91. Uh, just draw your attention to Rangatira Creek. This is another example of um, differences in the considered habitat extent uh, in that water body. And again, I've considered that the notified um, habitat extent should be retained because that's based on the experience of um, dock field staff who have worked in that habitat for a number of, number of years. And that concludes my examples. Thank you, Dr Dunn. Were there any other comments that you wanted to make in general terms around data set five or the maps before I hand you over for questions from the panel? Uh, it's a general comment would be that what we've uh, come to agreement here Dr. Gray and myself is probably the best representation of um, non-migratory uh, freshwater fish habitats available. It's based on a lot of expert um, opinion, uh, expert elicitation, um, but it, will, it is the best and most accurate data set available and most up to date. Thank you, I think that's appropriate point uh, in terms of any questions from the panel. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Solomon, any questions of Dr Dunn? Yes, thank you. Um, Thanks for your submission and your explanation about the maps, Mr Dunn. Um, I guess the obvious question for me is why did the Section 42A report reduce the areas? 
given that most of the habitat's been lost. And re could you further explain what you mean by reducing the area? Looking at, looking at the map, the section 42A red map, the red lines represents the section 42A report recommendation, I presume. Yes. Whereas the blue lines represented the extent of the habitat. So why the difference? I, I think that you, you'd have to ask Dr Gray his, his opinion on the Section 42A extents because I, I didn't input into that uh, map, mapping exercise. Perhaps you could answer for me, Dr Gray. Um, the, there was a, a range of reasons why I truncated the original map extents that were given to me by Doc. Um, some of them were to do with the fact that I based a lot of my mapping work on um, fish records in the New Zealand Freshwater Fish Database and looking at those, comparing the lines to the locations of the fish, I, I was struggling because there was no evidence of those fish in the database to accompany the line on the map. So if you like, I'd shorten the lines just to the area where there were clearly fish present. Now, what um, Dr. Dunn has subsequently explained to me is that not all fish records and observations go, go into the database. And so I'm more than happy to defer to his on the ground experience about the extent of habitat that those fish are in. But at the time I was doing a desktop exercise constrained by these, the, the fish database. Um, in other situations, I truncated sites because the, the street, there was no evidence that the stream was there. The, the landscape had changed significantly, the stream had been filled in, so I couldn't conscionably leave, leave a mapped site in there that didn't physically exist. Um, but the, there's, a, there's a mixed bag across the whole region, yeah, this is it's quite a big data set. Um, thank you. I wonder whether we can... Uh focus at the moment on uh, Dr. Dunn's evidence and uh, if you have questions to ask of Dr. Gray, we can cope at the appropriate time. I just have two or three more. Um, in your paragraph 31C, where you use the words widespread distribution, do you mean there are plenty of kākahi that distribute themselves in a wide era, area or only a few kākahi that spread themselves in a wide area? I ask because on Tuesday we heard from Meridian who said kākahi were relatively common, or words to that effect from memory, and yet they're on the at-risk category. I think what I'm referring meaning by um, widespread is uh, threatened species often uh, have restricted ranges, geographical right. ranges, um, whereas, um, say, Canterbury mudfish, its name alludes to it, is only found in Canterbury, whereas freshwater crayfish or freshwater mussels are more widely spread between, uh, across regions or across the, uh, both, both uh, major islands of New Zealand. So that's what I'm meaning by widespread. OK, thank you. Um, Narunanga seeks the mapping is extended to include their habitat required for their entire life cycle to take into account Kiutikitai and the interconnectedness of land, water and resources. This submission was then rejected by the officer. Then in paragraph 5.59 of the report it states, in reference to critical habitat of threatened indigenous freshwater species, critical habitat indicates the habitat critical to the life cycle and survival of the species. I cannot find any of the DOC submissions when DOC is asked the same as Ngā to take into account Kiutikitai and extend the mapped areas required for their entire life cycle, you know, to take into account um, spawning at sea, for instance, or vice versa, when fish come in and go to the headwaters to spawn, 
what, what is determined? What is meant by entire life cycle? I'll just go back and clarify as well that um, the species which I've focused on are non-migratory, so the um, okay. They complete their entire okay. life cycle so, in, the, in the same habitat. They don't migrate uh, to or from the sea as part of that life cycle. And your, your question on life cycle, wasn't it? Yes. What you mean by a life cycle? Yes. Well, for a fish, uh, it, let's start at uh, the egg stage and that is um, spawned in a particular habitat. And then a, um, after a period of time, say for a non-migratory um, galaxis or a Canterbury mudfish, it could be about a month until that fish, uh, that egg hatches into a, a larvae, or to use a common phrase, a fry. And then that, uh, that individual would grow into a juvenile stage through the uh, through the summer into the autumn, and depending on the species, it may uh, then spawn in its first year. So that would, or it, it may be until the second year of its life that it spawns. So that that is the species life cycle: the egg, the larvae, juvenile, adult stages. Do non-migratory fish travel far to in their life cycle, like from egg to adult? Do they do they travel far? That aspect of their um, biology is little understood, but they are known to make movements within water bodies, and they can be quite substantial, um, up to three hundred metres in a day um, of tagged individuals. But in general, we don't understand very well the amount of movement um, of non-migratory species. Um, there is a specific term for it, and that I do um, put that into my evidence. It's, um, I'll find it. it. The term is patadromy, and it, it, it's in a suite of terms um, with diadromy um, for migratory species. And then within there, um, you have whether, a, say, a salmon will, um, as an adromus, it spawns, no, sorry, catadromus, it spawns in the fresh water and spends some of its time in the uh, marine environment to grow and then returns to the fresh water. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, that's all from me. Any questions for Mr. Van Borges? Yes, thank you, Dr. Dunn. Um, the work you did with Dr. Gray, was that desktop study or did you do field work as well? The, the exercise we did was a desktop study, mm -hmm. but it is informed by a large number of field observations. Yep. Yeah. And, I, and I heard you refer in your verbal presentation on one of the maps to the experience of dock field officers as well, leading yes. into the exercise. Yes, so I went in creating my data set, I've run expert elicitation processes to gather that information. Um, but yeah. And just the issue of what the, um, these things should be called in the plan, I'm notified as IFHS recommended in the 42 hour report to be CHTIFS. Do you have a preference? No, <laughs> I, I, I haven't given it much thought. I've concentrated on yeah. um, making sure that the, the mapped data is uh, as good as possible. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> no, fair enough. Look, well, I'd just like to um, thank uh, you, Dr. Dunn and Dr. Gray, for the huge amount of work you've obviously done. It's very important um, to get these mapped areas correct because of the implications they have primarily for rules and, and activities out in the field. So certainly appreciate that work. And it's always nice to get an agreed position on these things. Um, Thank you.
So just um, just the 42A team, just the only thing I'd like confirmed in reply then is just uh, Mr Van Merlo addressed scope quite comprehensively and based on his legal submissions it seemed to be fairly well covered but just in reply could you just confirm that all of the amendments now presented to us are, are within scope. So I'm not, not seeking any further technical advice because of the agreement between Dr Gray and Dr Gunn but just that scope issue, just confirm that's all covered yeah. off. Other than that, no further questions, thank you. Thank you. Well, but thank you again, Dr. Dunn, and uh, I endorse what's been said, and uh, we're grateful to you for your contribution. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can we come to this fence now? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, your full name is Anita Maria Spencer. That's correct. And you've prepared a statement of evidence dated 17 July 2020? Yes. Do you have any changes or revisions that you wish to make to that statement? No, I don't. Right. Would you please answer any questions from the panel? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Spencer. Um, do you have any questions of this witness? Commissioner Van Um Just one out of interest, paragraph 19. And your um, translocation to another site, just in, in the things you address in paragraph 19, how's that worked out for you? How's it, how have those translocations gone? Um, it's a difficult one to monitor because it's inside the cheetah enclosure. <laughs> um, so we haven't been back this year we've, because it's quite big habitat we were going to leave it a couple of years <clears throat> no it's interesting other than that no further questions thank you commissioner solomon no i have no questions except to say keep up the good work and look after the mudfish thank you <laughs> well Thank you, Ms. Spencer. Thank you for your evidence, and we're grateful to you for what you've Thanks very much. Thank you. And just um, to, to remind the panel, um, Council for the Isaac Wildlife Trust have requested leave that Ms. Spencer be available and attend the hearing this afternoon when they present their case. So, Ms. Spencer will be back before you this afternoon if you've got anything else that, that does arise. Um, and now we're we'll talking about important things to be doing as well. Yes, well, it was it was the trust request, and we're happy to oblige them in, in that respect. But yes, well, now thank I, you. Well, Ms. Lim, Ms. Limmer will uh, no doubt uh, to bring to our attention whatever further uh, information we should have from Ms. Spencer. Yes, yes. Now that bring, yes, that brings us to a final witness, Mr Brass. Now your full name is Murray John Brass. It is. And you've prepared a statement of evidence dated 17 July 2020. I have. And you've also prepared a statement of rebuttal evidence dated 17 September 2020. I have. Now your evidence in chief refers extensively to the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management 2017. Do you have any amendments or updates you wish to make to your evidence? Um, yes, and I'd like to refer to um, attached to uh, Mr Van Merlo's um, legal submissions, the comparative table um, comparing the MPSFM 2014-17 um, and the comparable provisions in the MPSFM 2020. Um, and really my concern there was, particularly in my evidence, um, but also um, some of the other um, people appearing for the Director General have referred to the MPS CFM 2014-17, um, and I wanted to be certain that those references, the assessments made based on them and the conclusions drawn, were still applicable. Um, so what I've done in that table is gone through the provisions that were referred to, um, mapped them 
um, as much as possible against the 2020 version. Um, from that, I'm comfortable that in all cases the 2020 version does support the assessment and conclusions that were made based on the 2014-17 version um, with probably one um, minor thing that I would just draw to your attention, um, policy A2 in the 2014-17 version um, in terms of addressing degradation or degraded water bodies. Um, it requires councils to set a defined time frame to meet objectives. The 2020 requires councils to act as soon as practicable, um, so they have to start as soon as they can, but it, which the previous version didn't require, um, but they don't have to set a time frame to achieve the attribute or outcome. So there's a, a subtle shift um, there. I don't think that derogates from uh, the assessment and conclusions, but there is a shift there that I would just um, want to be noted in terms of having the correct record. Um, I would also just, I guess, draw attention in my rebuttal evidence to the extent uh, possible in terms of rebutting and responding to um, other evidence. I have referred to the MPSFM 2020 when addressing fish passage um, and also when addressing um, reduction in nutrients. Um, I don't have anything further to add, but just to note that in both those cases, the MPSCFM 2020 does quite considerably add to um, the weight to the original argument, if you like. Um, and the only other change that I would just for the record is note there are a number of places in my evidence um, where my, my planning conclusions are based on the technical evidence. Um, we've heard this morning a number of areas where um, those witnesses have updated on the technical evidence. Uh, so just for the record, note that um, I do defer to those, those updates um, and where that has any impact on my evidence, please read that um, now as deferring to the updated um, experts. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Were there any changes uh, other than what you've just described that you wish to make to your evidence in chief or rebuttal? Uh, no. Uh, thank you. Well, would you please answer any questions from the panel? Commissioner Solomon, do you have any questions yes. to ask of Mr Brass? Yes, just one, um, and it's about your rebuttal evidence. Page 2, paragraph 6. Um, what is the likelihood that Kākahi will settle near or in close proximity to the hip structures, given that from time to time they may be disturbed by humans? Um, I'm, I'm not the technical expert in no. terms of where they are. I think my point from a planning perspective is that those maps should accurately reflect where the, the critical habitats are. Um, and then if there are exemptions to be made for hydroelectric power generation, um, then that should be dealt with through policies and rules rather than by, um, if you like, pretending that the species doesn't actually exist there. Um, but in terms of where are the critical habitats, I would defer to the experts on that. Thank you. Commissioner Van Gorten. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Brass. No uh, comments from your evidence in chief is very helpful. I mean, I've highlighted lots of areas in there, but there's no um, issues that I wish to clarify with you. Uh, but in terms of your rebuttal evidence, just two matters. The first one's at paragraph eight, which Commissioner Solomon, I think, was asking you about as well. In terms of your planning advice there that um, the map layers should reflect known actual locations of critical habitats. The evidence we've had from Meridian, for example, is that the freshwater mussels in the hydro lakes, Benmore and Aviemore, only occur in a, a band of shallow water, sort of in the two to 10 metre deep range, not within the whole lake. So if we accept that, um, that technical evidence, 
your planning evidence would lead us to only then map those uh, fringe areas? Um, yes, although I would note, um, having viewed that um, in terms of the recording, there was also some discussion about the um, juvenile stage where they, they disperse. Um, so I think that would need to be considered in, in talking about um, sort of all of the critical habitats through the life cycle. But as to what and where is critical, um, again, I would defer to the experts yeah. on that. So I think that that stage of the life cycle needs to be considered, but it would be for the experts to say what locations are critical at that stage of the life cycle. And just one further at paragraph 21. And I'm looking halfway down that paragraph and you see you've got some words in brackets, MPSFM 2014, amended 2017, policy AA1. You see that? And, and then the next sentence goes, I consider it would be inconsistent with Tamano to to risk further degradation of, of water quality. So what you're saying to us there, that in your view, the MPSFM 2020 is essentially evokes a non-degradation approach to water quality management? Perhaps not so much about the non-degradation, um, but the degradation that's occurring as a result of um, human activities, and so meeting those economic, social, cultural um, needs. Um, to Mana to why clearly places the, the health of the water body ahead of that. Um, so if the degradation is a result of something that's at the third priority, um, then that third priority needs to give way, if you like, to the, the first priority, which is the health of the water. It's highly likely that um, any degradation of water quality would be the result of human activity, isn't it? So. I, I think that's probably the case, but it's, it's that priority order that's driving it rather than uh, degradation per se. Yeah, interesting. All right, thank you. No further questions, but thanks for your evidence. Coming back to your uh, original um, evidence, Mr. Grass. There are two or three points, and I'll come to one, where I noticed in, in uh, reading this through that I had a question about scope. And that may, of course, have been uh, dealt with by council submissions earlier, but I just want to check with that if I can uh, ask you to pause a moment while I try and find those passages. the pagination on, on the, uh, the, the foot of your page, page 55. Paragraph 252. You were making a, a recommendation there in the last sentence about the, an amendment to the heading the table 8A. Uh, and I, I just wonder whether you've got a comment about uh, whether this council would have scope to make that change? I, I guess my comment would be that I'm not seeking there anything which is a change to um, the intent or content. Um, it's more about the presentation so that it is clearly, ava clearly available on that table. I, I understand your answer. I've got a couple more of the same time. You go to page 56. I think it's paragraph 
256. And there's a similar remark there, and I take it that your, your answer would be the same. Um, yes, it would, although if I remember correctly with that one, I wasn't entirely sure myself um, <laughs> what was intended in the plan. Um, so I'm not arguing in terms of the content, but it would be good to have that expressly there so that it is clear for readers of the plan. I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Now, page 58. So, so, uh, paragraph 268. This is a slightly different context. And you're able to give me some uh, feeling of assurance that the changes that you're endorsing would be uh, within the council's scope. Um, so just to be clear, this is uh, paragraph 268, which starts from a plain perspective, I do not see that the fact, etc., etc. Yes, have, have I got the correct I paragraph? The changes yeah. recommended by Ms MacArthur should be adopted that the council has scope to make those changes? Um, I think there is scope um, there. If I recall, it's more around um, consistency flowing from other provisions rather than it being something that the Director General had expressly sought in the original submission. So it's a consistency driven scope. So would you say that it's a consequential? Yes, yes. Thank you for that. I think that's all the questions that I have for you, Mr. Brass. So you've presented a very uh, comprehensive statement of evidence, and we're grateful to you for it. Thank you. So that concludes the case for the Director General of Conservation. Unless there's any further matters arising from the panel, which I can assist with. Commissioners, anything further you want to raise with the council for the department? No, uh, not from me, Chair. No, not from me either. Thank you, Mr. Van Mielo. We've uh, received and understood your case, and thank you for it. Thank you. So. Uh, <clears throat> What time do we start uh, with the next witness, uh, the, the next submitter, um, Ms Fernando? Is it 2 o'clock or? Yes, that's correct, 2 p.m. 2 p.m. So that's the Isaac Trust? Yes, that's right. Thank you. All right, we'll adjourn now till 2 p.m. <laughs>